Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of Inside the Naval Postgraduate School from the campus in Monterey, California in the midst of the beautiful Cactus Garden. I'm your host Alan Richmond right here on the Pentagon Channel. Well in this episode we'll look at the ninth annual acquisition symposium that brought over 300 military officers to Monterey recently. We'll talk to the former commanding officer of the USS Cole. We'll talk to Miss Latina World, an Afghan vet who's playing a big role model for young women in the STEM program. We'll also meet the new Dean of Research and Vice President of the Naval Postgraduate School. Well, to start off the show this time around, we'll visit with Admiral Jim Green at the ninth Annual Acquisition Symposium that was held recently in Monterey, California. The Naval Postgraduate School's ninth Annual Acquisition Research Symposium was recently held in Monterey, California. Nearly 300 military officers, civilian acquisition officials, and representatives from the commercial defense industry gathered to focus on relevant acquisition research and promote defense spending affordability, as well as to listen to talks and panel sessions led by prominent leaders from the defense acquisition community. We spoke with several of the NPS students attending, as well as Admiral Jim Green, who organized the event. Well, it provides a two-day opportunity for the policymakers um, to get together. Um, many of these folks, uh, they're, it's, it is the senior leadership team of, of acquisition in the Department of Defense uh, from all the services and the Secretary's office. And um, they often meet together in Washington in formal meetings, but they don't often have a chance to talk together. and and really critique each other and, and try to s sort out uh, new avenues for approaching things. Uh, it brings their thoughts and skills together with um, the, the scholars from around the country that uh, have put a lot of thought and research into this, which they're viewing for the first time. So we, we hope it's a two-way street. We listen to what the issues are um, from the policymakers, and at the same time, uh, they get to see the original research uh, from these folks that may impact their policy making for the future and, and hopefully uh, help them make the set the policies that will be effective for the warfighter uh, going forward. At the same time, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to expose the NPS students to the top leadership of the Department of Defense. And in that regard, this was, uh, this was about as good as it gets. We uh, actually have uh, stuck with the same theme because um, we, we thought uh, a lot of symposium changed their themes, but we liked ours so much. Acquisition re research, creating synergy for informed change was, was really what I would think uh, what we're all about in the acquisition research program and really no need to change that. So uh, what we do, uh, what I try to do is from a whole host of papers that get submitted for, um, for presentation at the symposium, we try to uh, cover the whole spectrum of acquisition from, from program management to contract management to financial management to the acquisition workforce issues to logistics. Uh, so the, the idea is to try to get a complete spectrum of ac acquisition so that um, any of the uh, functional interests in acquisition will have something that would be of interest to uh, not only the policymakers but the students here who cover all those areas at the school as well. And that's one of the things we try to do is uh, to provide that this really I think helps to round out their their um, academic experience here at NPS the, uh, to get to meet in this close quarters with the, uh, the senior leadership of the department is, uh, is very, very unique. I mean, even people in the Pentagon probably don't get the opportunities that these um, young officers have had over the last two days. And a lot of those have been one-on-one -on -one conversations with our leadership, something that you could never hope to get that, that they're normal at that grade structure that they have. One of the biggest realities, that, which came through loud and clear from a lot of the speakers today, is um, the focus on unit cost, uh, the cost, the unit cost of our, our war products like aircraft, ships and the like has gone up dramatically. And that's something that we, uh, has not existed in the past. We would, you know, would budget, you know, uh, X for a project and it turns out to be 10X. And in this kind of a fiscal environment, uh, that certainly cannot be the case. So there's the, a lot of emphasis on affordability and, and, and uh, and trading off cost is just as important as performance uh, and schedule going forward. So I think you're going to see a lot of emphasis on the cost of things because uh, we, uh, we can't be buying one airplane and one ship a year, which is where we're headed if we don't get uh, costs under control any better. And I think that was probably a biggest message that came out of the symposium. What they discuss here and the policies that they're talking about are, are the backbone of national security. If we don't do these things correctly, and that was one of the big messages this time with the budget cuts that appear to be looming on the horizon for us here, that we need to do better uh, and, and get things out faster to the warfighter. And uh, that message certainly came through loud and clear 
uh, from the leadership today, and I think the students and, the, and the, all the other researchers really picked up on that and will probably now start to focus their, their um, research over the next year on the big picture of affordability and that sort of thing going forward. It's a networking tool for a lot of reasons, and I could use my own experience as one. I, uh, I had the good fortune of leading the Aegis pro uh, shipbuilding project um, years ago when I was on active duty. And uh, when I took over the program, almost all my uh, division directors had been my classmates here at NPS many years before. So you start the team building for the, the future of the defense team going forward right here as a student. And with uh, the joint aspect that we have at the school, uh, it, um, it, it certainly will serve the country well, I think, as, as we, uh, we learn to fight together in a, in a joint uh, way. Um, and uh, the students clearly um, are, are making great uh, uh, connections, networking connections uh, amongst themselves for the teams that they'll clearly, joint teams that they'll clearly be on uh, in the future. At the same opportunity, the, uh, the researchers do a lot of networking because uh, w what will happen at this event is that uh, people from different two, to diff two or three different universities might uh, see each other's paper and decide they ought to work on a paper next year. So the next, so there's a lot of synergy that gets involved in, in developing the research and and uh, hopefully that brings more thought, different thought to old problems that we haven't solved yet and maybe this time around we solve them. To my knowledge there is no other forum like this uh, that exists in the country. This is the only place that brings scholars of the acquisition process together to discuss their research findings. It is not a trade show. It's completely different than any of the symposiums and conferences that you hear about that normally go on during the year. Um, these are our future leaders, the students here at the school, and this is, this is tremendous exposure for them. So it's a real leadership training session, if I, I would say, for them, as well as the, just the knowledge they're picking up. But uh, again, to see how, uh, what concerns our so senior leadership and how our senior leadership thinks about those things and their willingness to come out there, come out here, most of them from quite far away, uh, to, sh to share the time from their very busy schedules. Um, uh, really impresses, I think, the audience, that they're willing and it's important to them that uh, we get a, a lot of young people. We have some gaps in the acquisition workforce uh, because we lost so many people uh, in cuts of the last uh, 10, 15 years where we're rebuilding that workforce now. The students here are that workforce of the future and this is our opportunity to get them uh, really on the right track of, of uh, how to, how to uh, start mapping out their careers and contributing from uh, the get-go as soon as they leave NPS to the, the health of the acquisition community and our future going forward. Well, at the symposium, we had the opportunity to talk with the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy. To start off, here's Lieutenant Commander Thompson. Uh, my field of study is acquisition and contract management. This is actually my first experience in acquisition, really. is just the, the first 18 months here. is the first time I've ever really touched acquisition in a, in a tangible way. So it's, so it's been a really rewarding experience, really seeing how the big these big machines, big ships, big missiles that I've seen and worked on uh, throughout my career and kind of where they come from and how it, how it all comes together. You yeah. always knew that someone someone bought it and someone made it, but seeing how that whole process works has been a, been a real rewarding experience for me. I attended last year, I was, I was just barely new in the school and I was talking to a friend of mine earlier and last year I didn't, I heard these people talking about these things, I had no idea what it meant and this year I've, I've having gone through the entire curriculum now, I kind of I have a much better grasp when people start talking about things and throwing out acronyms. I know what they're talking about now. And it's been, that's been a big, that tells you that you're learning the right things when you understand what they're talking about now. Well, what the speakers have given me, first of all, is seeing so many people who are, who have, I mean, we saw, I got to see Dr. Gansler speak yesterday. He wrote two of the textbooks that I've, that I've been working with since I've been here. So you see things like that. And then seeing that, that so many people have studied this from so many different angles and also a validation that some of the things that I've thought about and talked with my professors about during my time here, that those are real world thoughts and those are real world applications and there is a, besides just seeing it in PowerPoint and seeing it in a textbook, there are real world applications to what, we're, what we talk about and what we do. Just seeing all the different research and seeing all the different topics, that, uh, the different angles that people look at, what you think is one linear problem and seeing the different angles and different directions people can take it is really, you see how big acquisition really is. Well, I think it'll help my career a lot because it'll, like I said, it kind of focuses the thoughts that I've had about the big A acquisition and kind of what what acquisition is and then seeing how these people, how uh, some of the, the speakers, especially the high ranking speakers and some of the uh, researchers have looked at the problem. It adds just more tools to your tool bag and more things to consider when you're looking at, you know, for me going into a, a contract administration role after this. I'm always surprised by how many people outside of what you would consider to be the, 
defense system. You know, you expect people at NPS to think about this stuff. You expect people at DAU to think about this stuff. You expect government think tanks about this stuff. But people from universities in, in England, people, f you know, people from, uh, I met a guy last night from Clemson University, which is not far from my hometown. And, you know, people are thinking about stuff outside of what you would consider the, the, the defense, the defense think tank, I guess, would be the. Here's Captain Jennifer Mapp of the U.S. Air Force. Uh, this has actually been a great opportunity for myself and my partner for our uh, MBA project that we're working on. Um, we're looking at getting senior leadership perspectives, so we've been able to network with uh, some folks we generally would not have access to and provide us insight into what's going on in DOD, the Pulse and the acquisition community that we, that's going on right now, and so it kind of leads us in the directions that we need to be. I think the highlight for me is just having the opportunity to hear what the senior leaders are uh, focusing on right now and seeing some of the initiatives that they're taking to in the face of the budget cuts and everything else and, and see how they're looking to apply some of the future changes to acquisition community to make us more agile and I guess effective force. Um, right now, honestly, we've been focused a lot on our research, but um, the, there's a program this afternoon that we'd like to get to, and that's about the HADR, the Humanitarian Assistance uh, Disaster Relief Assistance. And I'd like to see what they're doing in that arena as far as future, because most of our contingency operations probably in the near future are going to be focused more on those type of relief operations versus large scale. Um, combat operations. I think it's a great opportunity, something most people don't get to see this many of our senior leaders in one place at one time and hear what they have to say on, on current topics. And finally, Major Ryan Ocampo from the Army. To me, I'm getting, what I'm getting out of it is the, the current pulse of the DOD uh, when it comes to supporting the warfighter. Um, you've got a lot of the heavy hitters within the DOD community and uh, we're, we're, we're seeing what the future holds. Uh, with the budget cuts and things that are, you know, for the future for the, uh, for the nation. Since I joined the acquisition community in uh, 2008, that's something that we've always tried to improve. Uh, we have processes, you know, currently in place, but we can always get better. So by taking, hearing, uh, well, two, two things. One, hearing from uh, what, what's being said from the speakers, as well as taking the, from the education, from the uh, uh, professors that are teaching us. We, we were able to put those two together and then uh, put practical application to what we've done and what we're going to be doing within the uh, within our current services and then try to apply it to uh, th things that we're doing. You, you, you hear the numbers that the big huge percentages that they're telling us to cut uh, the Department of Defense budget and uh, it, it gives me relief knowing that there is a plan and uh, uh, it, it is doable. Um, we're going to be uh, asked to make some sacrifices um, overall but it is doable and, and, and uh, I feel better knowing that there is a plan. Oh, just being able to uh, see, um, I use the term heavy hitters, just everybody that affects the DOD acquisition process um, is here. And so it's, be, it's uh, good to see everybody come together, um, have, their, I mean, everybody wants the same thing. Everybody's going towards the same vision and just the different um, avenues in which we're going to achieve that. Well, stay with us. Coming up after the break, we'll meet with Miss Latina World of 2010, who's also an Afghanistan vet. Welcome back to more of Inside NPS. Well, being an Afghanistan veteran isn't quite enough. She also happens to be Miss Latina World of 2010 and serves as a role model for young women when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and math. Meet Valencia de la Vega. Well, I was a logistics officer after I graduated West Point in 1999. I went into the United States Army as a first, as a second lieutenant. And uh, my degree was in nuclear engineering and I had an opportunity to combine both science and logistics when I was in the United States Army. I had the opportunity to serve overseas in Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan where I applied my knowledge of science and my procurement and supply chain studies to everyday real life, real world mm -hmm. activities. Today I'm meeting with the youth in the community to talk to them about the importance of science, technology, engineering and math. We're going to talk to them about the importance of understanding how different sciences actually apply to their daily lives to help bridge that gap so they understand what science really is and how they could also be interested in it. The truth is if, if young kids don't get exposed to the sciences, there may never be an opportunity for them. And so we want to allow them an opportunity to actually see that these careers are available to them. And if they don't get exposure, they can't 
become what they don't see. And so we want to show them that it is possible for them to become something in science and be interested in math and that it's actually cool. It's not something relegated for nerds. Every cadet that goes to the United States Military Academy is exposed to the sciences. Every cadet graduates with a Bachelor of Science degree. And so I had originally enrolled thinking maybe I want to be a doctor, maybe I want to be something else. But as soon as I got the exposure to how great sciences were, specifically for physics, I realized that that's really where my passion was. And I think that's what's important for us here today, is that unless we talk to students, unless we talk to youth about what's available for them and what opportunities are there for them, they simply won't know. And I had no idea that I could be a nuclear engineer until I took physics. And I saw how awesome something like that was. And that's really what brought out the passion in me. So when I was at West Point, the ratio was 13 to 1 for uh, men to women. So quite often, I was the only female in some of my classes. Uh, more importantly, I was the only female in my discipline for nuclear engineering. And yeah, it can be tough. And we want to break through that. We want to bring more women into the science fields. We want to give them the opportunity and also for the Hispanic youth as well. All minorities say, look, here's an opportunity for you. We know that traditionally you haven't had these opportunities, but the world is changing, and now is your chance. So my grandfather served in the military. He served 33 years, and so while I was growing up, I was exposed to his career and saw that he had a fulfilling career where he felt like he was actually giving back to the community, giving back to our nation. And I was inspired by that, so I decided I also wanted to take that same route. Uh, I didn't enlist, I went straight to the United States Military Academy at West Point, and then that's how I got started. My message to them is, hey, science is cool. Don't think about math as something for geeks and nerds. Math is cool. Math is how you make money, right? This is the thing that sometimes they can communicate or they can understand and relate to. And so we'll be talking about how great the sciences are. It's cool, it's hip, it's not something for just nerds. So we'll be doing something like that. I hope they walk away saying I can be whatever I wanna be and that it's cool to be in engineering, it's cool to do math and science, and that it's also hip because you can be cool and you can be smart at the same time. Well, special thanks to Miss Latina World 2010, Valencia de la Vega for the great role model she is for many young women. Stay with us. Coming up after the break, we'll visit with a former commanding officer of the USS Cole. Recently, we had the opportunity to speak with the former commanding officer of the USS Cole, who was a guest speaker here at the Naval Postgraduate School and addressed our students. USS Cole Commander Kirk Lippold, a decorated former commanding officer of the USS Cole, recently visited with students in NPS and provided harrowing details of the deadly Al-Qaeda bomb attack on his ship in the port of Aden, Yemen in 2000. Well, Commander, thank you very much for taking time to appear with us here on the Pentagon Channel. Well, Alan, thank you for having me. Well, of course, you were the commanding officer of the USS Cole. Wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that bombing incident. We pulled in to Aden, Yemen for what we thought was going to be a six to eight hour brief stop for fuel. We are going to be taking on about a quarter million gallons. And at 11.18 in the morning, history changed. Uh, nobody anticipated. You spend a career hoping, training, and praying that something like that never happens. But in that instant where we had an explosion, in less than three milliseconds, the course of the Navy changed forever. How we do business around the world in the 21st century fundamentally changed. No one could tell the crew what to do because the announcing system was knocked offline, the alarm systems didn't work because of design flaws and other reasons. So with a ship in complete silence, without power in the forward two-thirds, they responded magnificently, fell back on the training, and did what was necessary to save that ship and save their shipmates. In your role as commanding officer, tell us a little bit about your perspective of leading those men and women. It, it is one of the most phenomenal gifts that you will ever receive. I know that a lot of people today, they think their focus should be on getting assignments back in Washington because that's where they can be next to the admirals and everything else that could determine their career. But the reality of it is a Navy is not made in the halls of the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill. A Navy is made by spending time at sea doing what is necessary to safeguard a nation's interests on the high seas. 
and going out there and having that opportunity to be in charge of and lead those young men and women through both personal example and how you do your business, whether it's in a division, a department, or in command of a ship, really sets a standard because you alone, as one of the leaders, must be able to convey to those people that you are leading that you not only believe in them, but they can believe in you as well. And to have that kind of confidence really is what leadership is about. Well, obviously there are lessons learned from this incident. Where are we and what are some of those lessons? There's absolutely work to be done. Uh, immediately following the event, I think they realized that the attack on coal was a critical intelligence failure. There was also a training failure. We were not expecting that attack. We weren't trained for it. We didn't have the rules of engagement in place. We didn't have the intelligence necessary to do it. Since then, the Navy has made a number of strides toward that effort. But once again, as time goes on and you get further away from the incident itself, the focus tends to once again be off the ships on the waterfront and ensuring they have what is necessary to safeguard them themselves when they're overseas, making sure that that commanding officer has the intelligence necessary to make the proper force protection decisions, and instead it's focused up. So I think that there needs to be an effort by the waterfront, by those commanding officers, to demand that they get the intelligence and training that they need. While it's very robust in some ways, I think in other ways we're losing our focus again. Familiarity breeds contempt. Nobody expected on the morning of 10-12, and we were caught short. We don't want to have that happen again. Well, here at the Naval Postgraduate School, we're very proud of our Regional Security Education Program, or RCEP. And a lot of our professors go out to sea and spend time with the crew members and deal with issues of changes in culture and, and uh, those kinds of issues. And I'm wondering, might that have been helpful in the particular case of the coal? I think it is one piece of a solution. The number one priority for any ship is to be able to conduct what we've said for years, which is sustained combat operations at sea. We have to be able to defend ourselves. Going into a region, once you've got that ability to know how to conduct those operations, to have that cultural awareness and cultural sensitivity, I think is an additional piece that adds just a layer of overarching sensitivity so that a ship's captain has the awareness of how to deal with people when they come aboard, how to talk to them, what the issues may be, but it should not be a driver in any way, shape, or form in, an, in a ship's ability to protect itself. Sir, I understand you're a graduate of NPS. Can you tell us a little bit about your time here? I am. I came here and was studying in what was then the Joint Command Control and Communications curriculum, somewhat technical, uh, but I also did a lot of overload studies in national security affairs, uh, specifically nuclear policy, but absolutely loved my time here. It was a great opportunity to not only decompress from being out at sea and on the fleet, I'd had five years of straight sea duty, but it was also a time to uh, get, a, get a degree and a great education. During your time at the Naval Postgraduate School, what do you find was the most important, say, takeaway? From the time here, it was the ability to think critically and analytically about problems, how to break them down, dissect them, and figure out how to solve complex problems. Well, we're very pleased and honored to have you speaking to our students this afternoon. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your message to them. Biggest thing I want to talk to them about is integrity and leadership. It is the ability to make the right decision at the right time for the right reason, but doing it regardless of the consequences. That really defines what integrity is. But when you look at it, it's leadership. These young men and women are going to finish with their degree here. They're going to go back out to the fleet in whatever field they uh, might, be prof might have their profession in, and they're going to contribute to how our Navy protects the sea lanes of communication around the globe and why it's important for us to have a Navy, why we need to be out there on station protecting those sea lanes, and how that provides for the security of our country, both economically and otherwise. Well, sir, once again, thank you very much for your time and for appearing here on Inside NPS on the Pentagon Channel. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be back at Monterey. Well, we certainly appreciate his fine service, the former commanding officer of the USS Cole, Commander Kirk Lippold. Well, coming up, we're going to turn our attention to the NPS Spotlight, this time on the new Vice President and Dean of Research here at the Naval Postgraduate School. NPS Oceanography Department Professor and Chair Dr. Jeffrey Padwan has been selected to serve as the new Vice President and Dean of Research at NPS. 
He'll be filling an important role at NPS as the university's research is highly regarded within and beyond the defense community. He served in the oceanography department for the past 21 years. Again, the NPS spotlight falls on the new vice president and dean of research in NPS, Dr. Jeffrey Padwan. Congratulations. Well, that's it for this edition of Inside the Naval Postgraduate School. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Alan Richmond, here on the Pentagon Channel. We'll see you again next time. Take care.